Hi everyone, my name is Brother Robbins. I'm a faculty in our BYU-Idaho Academic Support Department. And uh, this is a, a brief tutorial about transformational learning, especially as it relates to BYU-Idaho's learning model. Several years ago, there was a researcher named David Kolb who pr proposed that learning happens in a cycle. We have a concrete experience, we reflect, uh, have reflective observation about that experience, we formulate hypotheses about our learning, and then we test those hypotheses. Now this might seem, speaking of abstract, this might seem a little um, nebulous as far as what this means. But if we put uh, a specific example to this, suppose we're trying to learn a language, especially how to pronounce words in a foreign language. We might um, try to pronounce words and then we might observe to see if the way that we pronounce the words is the same way that native speakers did. If if it didn't work, then we might form a hypothesis or a couple of hypotheses. Maybe I listen to more media uh, in order to improve my pronunciation. Maybe I try to move my tongue position in different ways to pronounce certain vowels or consonants and so on and so forth. So we might have these hypotheses that we then test. And if they don't, we make observations about our tests. Is this working? Is it not? Is it, if it's not working, we formulate new hypotheses until eventually we see that the hypothesis that we test actually works. And if it does work, then Kolb says we've learned something. <clears throat> now, um, a biologist named uh, James Zoll wanted to test Kolb's theory. And so he wanted to see through a series of brain imaging scans if different parts of the brain mapped actually to the different steps of David Kolb's uh, learning cycle. And true to form, he found that through um, some experience that learners were having, when they observed that experience, when they sensed it through you know, sight, uh, smell, taste, hearing, feeling, those type of things, that the sensory and post-sensory part of their brain was activated. And then as they made reflective observations about this experience, the temporal integrative cortex in their brain was activated. So it was following this cycle. And then as they hypothesized about different things, their frontal integrative cortex, that part of their brain became activated as well. And then finally, through actively testing their hypotheses, the motor part of their brain was activated. And so he found support for uh, David Kolb's experiential learning construct. Now, there's a couple of things that Zoll and Kolb were missing. Number one, concrete experience is kind of an abstract concept. It's, it's uh, kind of a generic concept. So we can think of that in terms of challenges we have or problems that we're trying to solve, experiences that we're having, or even behavior that we're trying to emulate like in the case of trying to learn a language. And then we might make observations, but our observations might be obsolete, so we need feedback. If you recall back to the article that we read earlier about growing our brains, uh, belief in our ability to learn plus effort plus help, i.e. feedback from others, allows our brains to grow and develop. So feedback is a very important part. Another really important part uh, is motivation. If we're not motivated to learn something, either through our growth mindset or our grittiness, uh, things that we've studied this semester. If we're not motivated to learn, we're probably not going to learn very effectively. And then finally, after we test our hypotheses and find that they work, then we need to intentionally practice the things that we've, we've learned. Um, as we've learned from Zoll, in different parts of our, our brains are neurons. So in the sensory part of our brain, we have neurons. In the motor part of our brain, we have neurons. And as we have an idea that we put into practice, those neurons start communicating with one another through what's called a neural pathway. And the more that we practice the things that we're learning, put those into practice in our lives, the stronger those that neural pathway becomes. And the more and more we practice, and the stronger that pathway becomes, the more our brains start to change. And that's the premise of James Zoll's book. James Zoll's book is that our brains change and they grow as, as we learn. Now, how does this all relate to the BYU-Idaho learning model? Well, it does. When we prepare for class, we're having experiences, learning experiences, or behaviors we're trying to mimic, or we're trying to solve problems. So preparation is really, really important. But to really effectively prepare and to learn, we need to be motivated. So growth mindset, grit. But also, because this is a faith-based institution, we need to have faith in the Savior and His grace, that His grace will enable us and empower us to be uh, to learn, to grow, and that our weaknesses might become strengths through his atonement. So this is a really fundamental part. Another tenet of the learning model is to teach one another. And this comes 
through uh, feedback that we receive from other people, observations that they might make and they give to us, and things that we learn from one another. And then as we ponder our learning, as we ponder the observations that we're making and the feedback that we receive, and we ponder ways in which we can um, put hypotheses into action, we need to prove those things. Another tenet of the BYU-Idaho learning model by testing our hypotheses. And as we do those and we prove our learning, then we need to continue to take action. And action is really a principle of faith. So coming back to motivation. And uh, it can't just be um, thoughtless action. Again, according to Angela Duckworth, this needs to be intentional practice. So think back to the Scripps National Spelling Bee contestants who advanced the farthest. They were the ones who intentionally practiced Latin root words and Greek root words in their spare, spare time. As compared to those who passively practice spelling by reading books uh, and other things. Um, intentional practice w is really the crux of the entire, um, the entire mantra of BYU-Idaho, which is to know and do and become. So the point of a, of a liberal arts education like the one that you'd receive at BYU-Idaho is for you to be transformed by your experience to, as in scriptural terms, to become new creatures, as it were, because you're learning new things, your brain is growing, these new ideas that you're putting into action are changing who you are. So the knowledge that you get put into action uh, with intentional practice will equal this becoming, you becoming, you know, um, uh, you know, a greater disciple of the Savior, becoming more civically responsible, becoming greater parents, uh, becoming, you know, greater members of society. These are all the important parts of a liberal arts education. So, um, everyone, I, I thank you for your time for listening to this. Uh, really uh, take advantage of the reading, take advantage of the knowledge that you're getting, and let's come to class prepared to teach one another to ponder and prove those things that we are learning, and then together to take action upon these things so that we can be transformed through our learning experiences here at BYU-Idaho. Okay, thanks for listening, and I look forward to seeing you all in class.